hello hello everybody and welcome to my channel <laughs> hello everybody and welcome to my channel um happy happy friday i guess it's very hard for me to do this streaming because i get zero feedback from the internet like i can't see an audience so it's very weird hi jack good to see you um i guess like I would like to try to do more coding today, so let's just get into the slides, I suppose. So let's let's do this, yes. But let's also tell Keynote to go into um, to play the slideshow instead of <laughs> just showing the previews. Okay, um, and then and then, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. All right. Hi everybody. Welcome to my welcome to my live stream. Um I can't see the presenter display for keynote, so I'm going to try and remember what slides I wrote. Uh happy Friday. Um let's talk about what we did last time and this is really killing me. We're going to bring up keynote. Come on. View um Play show presenter display in window. There we go. Great. All right. So last time, last time, a couple weeks ago, we were hacking on we were hacking on Tenderjit, um, and we implemented implemented a couple instructions there. I can't remember exactly what I think it was the and the optimized and instruction. Uh, we also talked about tagged pointers and how the Ruby virtual machine only deals with um tagged like tagged pointers so when you pass objects in or pass objects around the vm is looking at these these pointers and trying to figure out what they are uh, we also talked about how like uh, objects are aligned at 40 bytes and what that means is that the last three bits of any ruby objects address are always zero so we'll always have we'll always have three zeros at the at the end of any particular object um object address Ah, yes, here we go. We implemented opt-and. So we were looking at the opt-and instruction in Tenderjit. Uh, this time, however, this time we're doing something a little bit different. Um, it is my first time ever to have a guest on the program and I have a guest today, which I am going to bring in now. <laughs> hello, Evan. Hi. Oh, hello, how are you? <laughs> I'll I'll unzoom myself. Sorry, <clears throat> I'm good. Happy Friday. Yeah, happy Friday. It's good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you too. Uh, how have you been doing? Uh, it's been a whirlwind of a week for me. Okay. Uh, I'm happy that there's no one in my house today. Uh, I mean, like other people than the normally in or in my house. That has been a theme for the week, and that I don't have any extraneous house related activities to participate in today. Ah uh, yes, regular stuff. So. Yes, you're telling me about those house activities, and I am. Yes, I'm glad. I'm glad you don't have to deal with that today. Mm -hmm. um, for those of you that don't know, Evan, this is Evan Phoenix. He is a friend of mine and been in the Ruby community much, actually, longer than me for sure. Um, <laughs> and I'm super happy to, really happy to have you on the stream today. <laughs> uh, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> uh all right um yeah i don't know like as i have said in previous streams i don't like i don't really rehearse any of these very much so. uh, yeah i mean they're spontaneous it's yes all it's funny. A, it's i mean a, like it's a live you know stream. if you go if people are over on twitch there's not i mean like those those are genuine reactions to things you know this is the same thing they're just genuine reactions to assembly language though yeah. and, not, oh, yeah, yeah, and, not, yeah. and not headshots so. <laughs> yes Yes, actually, I was thinking. I was thinking about renaming the stream to basically like, like Ruby Internals TMI would be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, I mean, uh, I, I I definitely hope that that this shows up in like uh, some sort of pub trivia or stuff. Like that's that's what the what kind of pointers does the Ruby VM have? You know, like that's, <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, yeah. More exactly. than likely, how someone's going to use this information. So. Oh. Uh. Okay, all right. Let's let's continue on with the slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about tagged tagged pointers. Like talk some more. 
about them. We, we discussed them a couple weeks ago, but I want to get a little bit more into depth with, with them this week and then uh, move on to building a pure Ruby, a pure Ruby ARM64 assembler. So uh, the reason I wanted to talk about tag pointers is I'm hoping that we'll, I don't know if we'll have enough time on the stream today, but I'm hoping we'll get to the point where we can pass a, like a Ruby object into some uh, jitted ARM code and like deal with that, deal sure. with that. Uh, so if we're going to do that, we need to know about, we need to know about tag pointers a little bit more. So I wanted to cover those. Um, hopefully we'll have time, but I don't know. Um, so let's see, I have, I made a chart here and I'm going to remove us from the keynote so everybody can see it. Uh, this is a chart of tagged pointer addresses and it's the bottom eight bits of an address and you can see like along the top along the top are the the bit numbers and then uh, I guess what is that along the y-axis the column there is the different types of objects uh, false and true I wanted those to be in lowercase but for some reason like keynote when I put them in it insisted on making them uppercase but that's like the real Ruby object false and true uh, and I feel dumb because you're not your audio is not on here, Evan. I'm really sorry. I have to bring you back. Let's let's bring you back. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. Hello. About it. Hey, buddy. Okay. Oops. Hello. Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's look at the next look at the next slide. Okay, I'm gonna remove you again. Goodbye. Uh, so you can see that when we look, we were talking about how Ruby objects, the bottom three bits are always zero, but in this case, like. This I've highlighted the three the three bottom bits for each each of these different types of Ruby objects, and we can see like oops, we if we wanted to write like a function about a function that said like oh is this Ruby object a heap heap object, uh, we can just check oh are the bottom three bits zero so so this is like you know given an address can we determine whether or not this is a Ruby object, so we'll check are the bottom three bits zero. Um, but unfortunately, if you look closely at this chart, you'll notice that we have two other objects, false and nil, and both of them, the bottom three bits are a zero there as well. Uh, so we actually have to check those numbers like specifically. So we have to kind of change our function a little bit. So false is actually the number zero and nil is in hex uh, eight. I guess it's also eight, eight in decimal. I am good at numbers. <laughs> Uh, so if we were to write this function of, is this a heap object, then our function would have to look like this. And I think I can like, yes, I can bring, I can bring you back now. Cause there's not much important on these slides. Sure. So if we're going to write, if we're going to write a function, that's like, oh, is this a heap, heap allocated Ruby object or not? It's going to have to look like this. We have to check like, is it zero, uh, or like, is it eight, uh, and are the bottom three bits zero. And I like the reason I bring this up is I think it's pretty interesting because like in Ruby, we like to use objects. I think that using objects is pretty popular. So we have to do this check like a lot of times. So you yeah. like anytime we're calling methods or whatever, we have to do like, hey, is it, we can't just say, look at the, the bottom three bits. We have to say, look at the bottom three bits, but also make sure these other two cases are not, not, not true. Uh, yeah, so that's like yeah. that's an interesting, interesting. Yeah, I mean you issue. do it a lot, right? Every yes. time you want to do some operation, uh, you have to check that tag to yep. say, "Oh, was I? I want to call this or I, like." There's more exotic things, like if you're accessing an instance variable or something like that. Obviously, there's no memory behind an integer, so there, you have to go look at some other place. But people don't usually do that. But it's still, you have to do it if you want to know for instance like the most common one is where's the class pointer right so if i if i'm if i'm trying to find the method on an integer i can't go read the class pointer address for the integer because it doesn't it's somewhere else yeah so i have to know to go look somewhere else yeah so we have to say like oh is this a ruby like a regular class or is this an integer and based on that information then we know where to go look up like where to go look up the class and we have to like use that inf information to differentiate everything so right. Since this is such a common thing we have to do, reducing the number of checks, like the number of conditionals we have is like pretty important. Yeah. Uh, and right now it's at least at least those three, but it would be really awesome if we could like 
get it down more. Like if we mm -hmm. could make it one, that would be yeah. good. Anyway, uh, on to oh, on to an ARM sixty four assembler. I'm trying and I'm trying to watch the chat too, but I'm not. I'm, I'm watching it too, so you're Thank good. Thank you, Evan. Uh, so we're gonna build an ARM sixty four assembler today. So I kind of want to talk about um, like ARM sixty four. Uh, ARM sixty four has thirty one. 64-bit registers, and those registers are just numbered X0 through X30. So they're just called X0 through X30. But it also has um, 31, 32-bit registers. But that's not actually true. The, these 32-bit registers are the same as the 64-bit registers. It's just that we only look at the bottom 32 bits of that register. So if you see these two, X0 versus W0, the W0 just means like we're looking at the bottom the bottom 32 bits of the register, which of course I put into a slide. I said that. <laughs> then I just said the words it's like, with it, my it's mouth. It's like x86-64 in that case, right? So yes. it's like EAX versus RAX. Yep. So. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, let's see. Are now, there 16-bit versions like in x86? No, 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 no. Okay. Well, actually, uh, I don't remember. <laughs> I we won't use them anyway, but yeah, I don't, I don't remember. I just saw, I just saw 32, 32 and 64. Actually, no, there's no, there can't be. And you will see, hmm. we will see why okay. in a second. There is only 32 and 64. Yeah. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about a little bit is calling conventions. Um, and the reason I want to talk about this is because we're going to, today we're going to be jitting out essentially C functions. So we need to understand, we need to understand what calling conventions are. And a calling convention is just a convention for calling things. Uh, well, like, do we have to buy tickets to this convention? Is yes. it like a boat show? Yes. Or is it more? Is, or is it more like a? Is it like I always like the conventions where they sold hot tubs? You know, you can go <laughs> look at all the weird hot tubs that they had available. Is it that kind of convention? No, no, <laughs> no. Actually, I think this is. It's interesting. It's like it's. This is similar to convention versus configuration uh, uh, yeah. well, okay anyway um, i guess a calling convention would be where like at&t and horizon <laughs> and they all get together right that would be a calling convention yes yes excellent <laughs> okay so a calling convention is a calling convention is imagine so imagine we have a C library and the C library provides a bunch of different functions. For example, in this example, we have some function and other function, and some function might be provided in a library, um, but nobody knows like that function. Some function it doesn't know how like it doesn't know who's going to call it, right? It's just sitting in a library, so it has to know where to find those two parameters a and b like how does it find how does it find those parameters so in order to have like different c libraries that we can reuse between programs they we came up with essentially a calling convention and what this is 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 just like a standard for where we put parameters and put return values and this standard for where we put them, it changes depending on the architecture. And we're going to talk about the ARM, we're talking about ARM64 today. So we're going to look at the ARM64 calling convention. And this calling convention, like here is a chart for the calling convention. And I took this from the ARM, the ARM documentation. And I put the ARM documentation in the description for this live stream. So take a look at that and find the, um, find the, like, find the PDF version. Um, First time here. Is it going to be like this the entire st stream? Yes, it is. Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, in the ARM64 calling convention, we have um, all the parameters for a function are passed in x0, the x0 through x7 registers. So, if you want to pass parameters, you put them into those registers. Uh, I'm not going to talk about like. I guess I will talk about it. If you have a function that has more than, I guess, eight parameters, we have to push those onto the stack. Uh, and then we find those we find those particular ones on the stack, but we're not going to be dealing with that many parameters today, so it doesn't really matter. Like, it doesn't really matter for us. Yeah. The other interesting thing uh, that's different between ARM64 and x86 is that ARM64 actually allows you to have uh, multiple return values as part of the calling convention. 
So mm -hmm. on x86, you have to have you can only have one return value, and it's put into the racks register. Uh, and on ARM64, you're allowed to have multiple return values, though I don't know if anybody actually uses that because C functions only return one thing, and you put that into the X0, the X0 register. So the parameters come in on X0 through X7, and then our return values also come go back out in X0 through X7. That's handy. So, oh, hey, Choo Choo. Cat is... Cat is being here. So I I took that C code and like annotated it with what registers, like where values would be and in what register they would be in. And if you look at some function, basically the A value would be in the X0 register and X1 would be, or B would be in the X1, X1 register. Uh, ARM64, Allison is asking, does ARM64 also have a stack? Yes, it does. Yes. Uh, so if we were to kind of write this out in like essentially pseudo assembly code, like we'd add X zero and X one, we would put the return value in X zero, and then we would jump back to the point that we're, where we returned, which is in the LR load register, which is just another name for X 30. So if you think about where we return back to that's stored in the X 30, that's stored in X 30 or LR. Now. Yeah. Do you have to maintain that LR register? Or yeah, does it you get do. pushed and pop from the stack? Uh, you have to you have to push. So so if you call a function from some function, it has to push before it has to push LR before it makes makes another call. But if you know okay. you're not calling anybody, you don't need to you don't need to save okay. don't need to save the register. But you have to be sure then you need to like, oh, I'm gonna be calling somebody, but I need to return to somebody too. So I gotta push this LR register so that after I get it, I can pop that pop LR it. register yeah, exactly. and, then, and yep. then return to it. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise you'd cool. lose your you'll lose your return lose yeah. your return address. Yes. Yeah. So in other function, the call the caller, we have to place one because we're using the one literal. We put that into we put that into uh, X0 and then we put um two into x1 and there is a question jack there's no ret instruction yes there is a ret instruction and it does it all it does is essentially a jump to whatever is in x30 yeah. that's it's all just it is. jump dereference x30 basically yep yep, so. yep exactly so here we say like so the caller the caller you have to put it puts one into x0 and then it puts two into x1 then uh, it finds the return value in X0 and just subtracts from it and returns that. And actually, like this, this uh, the comments that I put in here are not 100% accurate because, like, in the in the sum function thing, it says like put the return value to X0, but really you don't need to do that because you just add into X0 and then you're all right. like it's already there, so you don't need to. Do yeah, you can anything. accumulate into X0 yep. basically, and then yeah, just yeah, know that exactly. it's already set up. Yep. So today we're gonna jit out a we're gonna jit a C function and we need to know how to get the get the parameters for the C function and where to place the return the return values, which is why we're why we're looking at this. Um, we have a question. Why not show assembler code? We will show we'll see many assembler <laughs> codes. Don't oh, worry. Oh, don't worry, Dorian. Don't uh, worry. Just, uh, <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna wish we hadn't showed it by the end of this stream. So <laughs> Somebody is asking with X0 and X1 being canonical first few parameters, does that mean it is thread specific? Do different threads have to rebuild their registers? I don't know how any of this works. Uh, the threads, when you switch threads, like when the operating switches threads, it'll save off the registers and automatically restore them for you. So you don't need to think about it. It's no, no problem. All right, so we're going to JIT a C function and we need to know how to assemble like we need to know ARM64 like instruction encoding. Like, how do we encode ARM64 instructions? And it's super easy, like really easy compared to x86. It's like very simple, and that makes me quite happy. Every instruction in ARM64 is a 32-bit number. All of them are 32-bit numbers. It is a fixed width. It's totally fixed width, which is completely different than x86. x86 has variable width instructions. Uh, here, we're just dealing with fixed width numbers, which is amazing. Yeah, we might not get to it, but in case people don't know, this makes, for instance, calculating jump destinations 
so easy, yep. like infinitely easier because you're like, oh, I need to go four instructions from here. I know exactly how far that is. Yeah, so. four, four times whatever 32 yep. bits yep it's yep. so nice hopefully we'll get we'll have time to do jumps but i'm not sure we'll we'll see yeah. so uh here's an example like we here's a very simple assembler written in ruby we have assembled two instructions and then we did it we're done <laughs> close the stream <laughs> we can quit the stream now we did yeah. it we've assembled two <laughs> instructions but all we have to do, like, really all we have to do is we have to, like, get these two, get these numbers, and then just pack them into some bytes, and then we're done. But this is, I mean, this is missing, like, a whole bunch of stuff, which is basically, oh, yeah, we did it, we did it! Ah! <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, this is missing, this is missing a bunch of stuff, like, you know, first off, what instructions did we assemble? Uh, I was wondering that myself. What did we do? Uh, second, like, can we execute these instructions? Like, can we make them go? And then the third one is like, where did these numbers come from? Like, how did, why did we choose to do these particular numbers? So to address the first issue, uh, man, you're in the way. Get out of the way. I'm gonna make you a little bit smaller, Evan. There we go. I'll make my face bigger then. <laughs> All right. Um, there you go. <laughs> so, in order to like, in order to deal with the first problem of what instructions did we assemble, I made this C extension called Hatstone, and it's just an ARM sixty four, an ARM sixty four disassembler. Well, it's not ARM; it'll disassemble anything. Uh, you can use it for any like any assembly code, but basically, you give it some binary data, and it will disassemble it and you can print that out. So we have on the left hand side is that those two numbers packed together, those bytes that we assembled, and then we're feeding that into the Hatstone gem and it's disassembling them and then printing them out. And if we run that, you can see that like, it was the mov z instruction uh, along with the ret instruction. So those are the two, those are the two instructions that we, that we assembled in our, in our code. That would be mov z for our Canadian Viewers. Mav Z, yes. Uh, so the other thing is like, can we like can we execute it? Because you know, writing an assembler is fun. That's nice, but it's not really very exciting unless you can actually run the code. I think. Uh, so I made another another gem called JIT Buffer, which just it's basically like uh, it's supposed to be a. Well, I'll tell you what it's supposed to be, and then I'll tell you what it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> So it's supposed to be a platform independent, like generic JIT buffer. So a place where you can write bytes in and then use that, like use that to execute, execute your bytes. So it gives you, it gives you some executable memory. It allows you to allocate executable memory right into the executable, me executable memory and then execute it. Now, the, what it actually is, is, it is that, but it's currently extremely specific to Mac OS. It doesn't work on any other platform. So <laughs> like we can make it work, I can make it work on other platforms and that's that's on yeah. a to-do, but uh, yeah. right now it's just specific, it's very specific to Mac OS. Yeah. So in this example, on the left-hand side, we assemble those two instructions and then we convert it to a function and we jump into that function using libffi. That's what the second to last line is doing. It's calling to function on it, and we have to tell it what parameters it takes. It takes a zero parameter, so we use an empty array, and it returns an integer, which is that uh, value to, to, what was it in hex? It was like 2a, yeah, ox2a, which is in decimal 42. So if we run this and call the function, it'll print out, it prints out 42. So we're able to jump into that code and actually execute it. Uh, so let's take a look at the next slide which is like, where did these, where did these magic numbers come from? Like, how do we come up with these particular, how do we come up with these particular numbers? And the answer to that is actually in the ARM, uh, the ARM manual. So the instruction, man the instruction manual for the processor, and this is a sample of it, which is too small to read. So I think I have zoomed in here. Uh, this is the MOV Z instruction, MOV Z instruction. And if you download, so if you download the manual for the processor, uh, it has all the instructions listed along with like some really helpful stuff, which I have 
added arrows and keynotes to point out in keynote to point out but here like this very top diagram is the diagram of the 32 bits the 32 bits for the the particular instruction and it tells you what each bit represents in the instruction so we have one right here that very top bit the 31st bit um, or 32nd bit I guess uh, if it's zero then we're in 32-bit mode. And if it's one, then we're in 64-bit mode. Oh. So which is why you were, you were asking earlier if there were 16-bit registers and there can't yeah. be because we only have two we only have two options. I missed your last stream. I, I uh, had other things going on, unfortunately. Um, did you cover the like re rex encoding, having to do rex encoding last oh, time? Oh, hell no. Or? No, uh-uh. Okay. Uh -uh. All right, it's very complicated. I would, if you're curious about how you do this on x86, it's actually really complicated where you switch between 64-bit uh, and 32-bit modes where there's a whole Dance. instruction prefix no. and stuff you have to put on things. So. No, 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 no. You did, you did your viewers a favor by not talking about yeah, it. Yeah, we don't want to look at that. ARM is, this is nice. So yeah. the next thing, the next thing here is like, you can shift, so for this MOV-Z instruction, you can actually take the value, the literal value, and you can shift it by a certain number of bits. And this lets you, like, the, these two uh, bits determine the shift for that, for that number. Uh, right here, we encode a 16-bit immediate value. So when we say MOV-Z x0 with that number, like two, in our case, we had OX2A, we encode that into this, into this area mm -hmm. in the instruction. And then finally here on the bottom, uh, that's where the register information goes. So the bottom five bits represent a register. And all of the, like every single instruction for ARM has this diagram listed and describes what each of them do. And one thing, like one thing I wanna point out is, um, I think it's super interesting about this documentation. So it's kind of hard to see, I'm gonna rewind a couple slides. Nope, not here, here. So do you see at the bottom here where it says like decode for all variants of this encoding? Mm -hmm. What's interesting is ARM provides an XML version of their, of their spec. And Ooh. this language is, uh, it's like a regular language that you can like parse and decode, but it is specifically for uh, decoding the instructions. So you can take that XML Ooh. file and actually generate an ARM, uh, uh, like a virtual processor for an ARM for the ARM architecture, which is kind of cool. Unfortunately, yeah. you can't go in the opposite direction, which I found out the hard way. You can't generate an assembler. Like I tried generating an assembler. Like you can get like ninety percent of the way there, but oh. it doesn't have all the information. And that like, huh. okay, that kind of sucks. I you was, can't just write an XSLT transform. No, I an assembler. I was trying to do this like. I'm gonna keep trying harder, but like um, I contacted, so so I found some somebody's blog post who was trying to do a similar thing to me, and I contacted the person, and I was like, I explained to him, hey, I'm trying to generate, I'm trying to generate an ARM assembler, and he was like, oh, I guess did you read this blog post of mine? And he sent me a link to a different blog post, which was exactly that. He was trying to generate an ARM ah. assembler. And at the very end of the blog post, he was like, okay. it turns out the guy works for ARM. So he mm. worked at ARM. Oh, God. Okay. <laughs> you, you, you found and, the source. You yes, found the I right found the source. To yes. to. Yep. And he's like, he was like, uh, it didn't have, he's, he ran into exactly the same problems I did. He said like, oh, I can't, like, it's missing this information. So I can't generate, I can't generate an assembler. So I tried to get support internally at ARM to like, to like update the documentation so that we can generate assemblers, but it just didn't go anywhere. Oh, <laughs> yes. And now, uh, and now he works at Intel, so it's like, oh, okay. Oh, well. <laughs> oh they, she, they should. I can't imagine what the 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 XML output for uh, x86 64 would look like for this. It would be uh, crazy. Well, I. Actually, there's there's projects online like my other my x86 assembler Fisk. It's completely generated, but it uses mm. a like it uses an XML file that I think the community put together. I don't yeah. think it's it's not official from Intel. Yeah. So is it intense though? Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. All right. I mean, so I love I love the pseudocode there at the bottom. You know, regardless of its completeness, because it lets you be like, oh, okay, good, pretty yeah, good idea. Yeah, you can understand. You, know? you can understand what the what the thing does. Yeah. Uh, so we're gonna do today. We're gonna do these. Like, I want to implement these uh, instructions. We're gonna start with Burke, uh, which is for creating breakpoints. Then we're gonna do MobZ, MobZ, then MobK, then Ret. Uh, add and then hopefully we can get to CMP and these b dot g these uh, jump jump instructions. So like, I mean I don't know if we'll be able to get that far, but let's like give it a go. Yeah. So let's. Oh, hold on. I had one more slide. That. Let's code. Yay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we want to go to goodbye keynote. You're going over here, actually. And then we're going to desktop mode now. Okay. Um, all right. So I have projects set up here, which I am calling ARCH, AARCH64. And it doesn't work. So I posted this on I posted it on GitHub so you can go like get the code and check it out but it's there's nothing in it it just has an empty like empty test so let's do what did I say we're gonna do first uh, break Burke that's right we're gonna do break um, and the reason I want to do break is because I want to I want to jit out a C function and then I want to like I want to break in it in that jitted code. Mm -hmm. and be able to have LLDB pause. So we're yeah. going to do we're going to do that. So let's do burk test.rb um This is where I start to get nervous. I set up like a I made like a base class thing here so we can do require helper. Oh, I also switched since my last stream, I changed the switches in my keyboard. They they sound lovely. Oh, thank you. They're what not as loud. Change them to. What's that? What 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 did you change change them to? Uh, I think they're like TTCs. I forgot the name. Like I forgot what they are exactly. They're TTCs. They're just um, what is it? Not linear. Not clicky. They're just tactiles. Yeah, they have a nice clunk. They have a nice clunk to them, and not a. It's not a. It's not a crisp chip, chirp here on stream so <laughs> well i want like i love the really loud switches that that's what i really want obnoxious switches oh what is this what is it with aaron and arms does it matter <laughs> tiny... <laughs> we'll do tiny arms i can't i don't want to stream tiny arms because it'd be too small for people to read it we got to do we're doing big <laughs> arms over here right now it's got to bump up that font size all right so we're gonna do class let's do let's do what are we doing burke test Test, ARH64, test. So what do we do here? Def test, burk, burf, burk. Okay. Uh, and what else, what did I do? What did I do in here? Let's do SP, let's edit lib and check it out. Okay. So we're gonna have an assembler. I think we'll do something like this. We'll do asm equals arch 64 and you know what i don't let's just i'm gonna include arch 64 because i don't want to type so much you know what i'm saying yeah oh yeah especially in a test yeah i don't want to type much so we'll do this and we'll do like asm uh dot burke yep burke seem good um mm -hmm. and then Oh, you want to look at the output buffer, or like, yeah, I don't know let's how make you, a, Or you want to look it. at the individual instruction? Maybe, maybe they just encode, get encoded as numbers, right? So you can just basically assert that the first instruction is a specific number, and let's that you do, don't even have to look at it as bytes. I mean, mm, so I want to have like I want to have my interface to be like write to JIT buffer. Okay. So let's look at the bytes. Let's look at the bytes for it. We'll do. Okay. So we'll do jit buffer and we're just gonna do like a string string io okay. seem good yeah and then we can do like disassemble actually i don't want to type much disasm jit buffer dot string and we'll assert that that's like 
So that's going to give us a list of instructions. Let's assert that there's only one equal one inessence.length. And then let's assert equal irk uh, inessence.first. Mnemonic. Yeah. Seem good? Yeah. Love like it. That? Okay. 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 Uh, and then if I do gel, gel exact, break test. What's okay. gel do again? It's like bundler, but fast. Okay. Cool. Love it. Uh, so asm.berk, and of course we don't have that, so let's do it. But the issue is lib air 64 def berk. Let's take a look at the spec for this instruction, mm -hmm. um, which I have here. Is this is this big enough for people? I'll zoom in a bit. Okay, so oh, interesting. This is another cool thing that I, or another thing I really like about the ARM spec is like they show you they show you what the assembly is supposed to look like. So it's, this is it right here, right? Mm -hmm. So it takes an immediate, so we have to do like, we can't just do Burke, we gotta do like Burke, Burke one. Uh, somebody is asking, Dorian is asking, what is the arm and the prompt for? Uh, it's because, it's because I use, like if I, I can switch to Intel mode, cause I have, I have um, Rosetta running on here. And when I'm in Intel mode, I, I put the little, little that emoji and if i go back to this mode <laughs> i'm on arm 64 <laughs> that's why it's okay a good use of a good use of command line emoji as far yeah. as i'm concerned so okay so we're gonna have we're gonna have an immediate here imm and we're gonna do um oh okay so we also have to have a right right so we'll have a right that takes an io and i think Def initialize. I think you called it right to, but yeah, you're right. Uh, right to. Thank you. Thank you, pair programmer. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate that. Uh, let's see. Uh, so so big a agile. I know it's so agile. Uh, we're gonna have a list of instructions. This let's just raise because uh, yeah. Um, Burke, let's get the thing here. So. Gonna move this here. I'm excited to see what your favorite method for bit packing in an integer is gonna be here. What do you mean? Like how are you gonna set those individual bits, bits of the of the number? I'm excited to see what your oh. what what your chosen your chosen method is. Well, so one thing like one thing I was thinking about here is I wanna do so eventually we wanna support jumps. Right. So I don't want to, first off, I don't want to, I don't want to assemble the instruction. I'm not sure if I want to assemble the instruction right away. I was thinking maybe we could do like INS and, uh, and then push on a Burke. Oh, okay. Right. Sure. Okay. Make it somebody else's problem. Sure. Exactly. So we'll do class Burke. So I'm hoping, the other thing I'm hoping is if I can do, so if I can generate the assembler from the XML file, maybe I can just have the, that generate oh, a whole bunch yeah. of that makes sense. classes. And then the assembler is sort of a, the the way of just cataloging all of them together and yep. yeah, calculating yeah. jump offsets and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I like exactly. it. Exactly. Okay, so we'll do def. Actually, let's just, yeah, let's def initialize. Uh, yeah. Seem good. That seems good. I would include instructions into assembler because you're gonna you're gonna reference it so much inside good there. Good call. Good call. Absolutely. <laughs> We're all about not writing stuff. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. So so we'll do that. So I guess Burke should actually Burke should work now, right? Like, I mean the 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 method will work. Yeah. Or not? Oh. Ah, right. <laughs> Maybe does it, is there? Does the uh, it, um, we for, we got a PDF say if there's a reasonable default value? Like, 
Let's look. It does. It does. I can tell you. I don't think it does. Breakpoint instruction generates a breakpoint instruction. PE records, blah, blah, blah. Captures the immediate value. So it's just whatever you want it to mean. Yeah. Okay. So we'll just do one. Seems fine. All right. So if we run this, it's going to raise an exception in write to. Um, and actually, yeah, okay. I guess let's let's implement let's implement right to. Um, yeah. Let's just do like I think what we should do I think is just do like map, map. Encode. Okay, you're gonna get a bunch of what's back. What's encode gonna return? Integers. Thirty-two bit integers. Okay, then yeah. Seem good? Mm hmm. Yeah, right. it's not writing, it's returning it. It's not writing anything yet. So you need to, you need to call. The, yeah, there you go. All right. Uh, so we'll do def encode. I guess now we're going to get to the fun part, which is like, um, we need that. We need this. Mm hmm. This is, this is the part I wanted to see how you're, what your chosen form for. Okay. Bit packing is. Well, we're going to do, I like this because it's written in binary in the, mm -hmm. in the things so we're going to do. What is this? One, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, zero. And then I don't know what this is for, but why they separated that. And then we have a 16 bit immediate. So one, two, three, four, five. And then one, two, three, one, two. So that's our base instruction, right? Mm -hmm. And then yep. we should just be able to do like ISN or equals IMM. And that's gotta be shifted up by five, right? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah. You yep. probably also wanna either, either in the initializer or in encode clamp it to 16 bits so that it doesn't overwrite the top of that. Good idea. Should we? I mean, you won't. We you you won't have that problem here because we're only going to pass in a couple of small numbers. But yeah, just as, a, just as an aside. Yeah, I'm not going to do it now. But yeah, 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 we got to do it or or mask it. I mean, I guess we could just do like and. Well, that's what I was going to say. That's what I meant by. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. Just, what's just sixteen? Just what's that. sixteen bits? That's eight. That? Three, four three four Fs. Four Fs. You yeah. know what's interesting. Uh, yeah, Jack. Uh, Jack asks, "What does the L greater than star be?" Ah, uh, that's uh, a good. It's that's the that's the the uh, string dot pack is its own teeny little DSL where you basically explain what to do, what you want to do with each member. Oh, it's a array dot pack. What you want to do with each thing in the array, and L is encode this value to an integer, and the eh, the less than is in the end in this? Yes. So L means okay. L means 32 bit. We got a 32 bit integer and we want it to be encoded little Indian, I believe. Okay. And the star just means just do that for all of them. Do all of them, yes. So we have a whole bunch of little Indian 32 bit integers and we want you to pack that into a string. And then Jack was saying, should we raise if it's greater than 16 bits? <sighs> Yeah. I mean, yeah, for now, I wouldn't worry about it. I would just, I think, I think clamping it with the mask is fine. So let's do this now because I want to do other, I want to do other stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's fine. Just, yeah. <laughs> I would just, just run it and move on with life. Ah. Oh, yeah. It's a, we, we, it's, yeah, at sign. There we go. And then if we run it, okay. So we don't have a disasm function. We need that, um, which, that is not like that's not what our our thing is about today. I think I have like a This is your hatstone thing, right? Yeah, hatstone. Uh I'm just gonna copy copy from here. Cause like I mean this is interesting or whatever, but the podca the podcast this stream is about writing an assembler, not writing a disassembler. So we'll do like def dis asm and disasm is going to take some code and the code is going to be 
fed into this. And actually, just do that, that, that. Yeah. I think that's all we need, actually, like that. All right, let's try it. Nice. Hey. Nice. Love it. Love it. Yep. All right. So now that we have the Burke instruction, let's actually execute it. Uh, oh, look at that. I already have a, a thing. <laughs> so <laughs> we have a JIT buffer. I'm including, we require Arch64. We don't need Hatstone. Uh, we have a JIT buffer, 4K JIT buffer, and then we create some assembly. We do Burke. Uh, let's do RET too while we're here. Sure. So that we don't just die. Yeah, afterwards. exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Let's go. We can just copy the same pattern that we did for, for break. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Oh, do I really want to have like a different file for every instruction? I, I was going to ask that question earlier, but I mean, for now, I would just don't overthink it for right now. I, your 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 disasm should probably be in your your parent um, test thing, but let's yeah. let's let's pull that up. S P S no S B U Burke D Okay, so we got this here. And then make sure our tests are still going, which I should probably get this like thing. Uh, toe bars. Is this one of those scenarios where if you don't close out properly, your computer crashes? Uh, not the computer won't crash. Your process will for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it'll just start to, it'll flow off the bottom of the JIT buffer and there's just going to be zeros there. And so you're, it, it'll just like seg fault basically. I, I don't actually know if there will be zeros there because the JIT buffer class does not zero out the memory. <laughs> well, but are you M mapping it? Yeah. Well, so a, a, an anonymous M map comes empty. Oh, really? Yeah. I did not know that. In fact, it's actually a, a thing. It's a feature you can use because the empty pages are also, uh, they're jitted. They're lazily loaded. Oh, yeah, right? yeah. So if you, so if you ask for like 10 gigs worth of memory, you don't get 10 gigs worth of memory. But when you access a page, it's like, oh, okay, let me get you a page. And they always come up. They always yep. come in empty. Yep. So. Actually, I was writing a, I, I was trying to write a benchmark to benchmark the performance of MMAP. And I totally forgot about the laziness, the laziness of the mappings. And yep. like, <laughs> if you do it, if you just do it and you don't write anything to it, it's super fast. Like you can allocate. <laughs> you didn't do anything. You, you just added like, some accounting. Hey, yes. I want this big thing. It's like, okay, you got the thing. Yep, so. exactly. You have to like write something to the byte and then it'll actually map it. And then it's like, oh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, let's see. So we're going to have test. Um, let's do ret test.rb. And I'm just going to copy. Yes. Uh, I'm just going to copy the book test. which I'm <laughs> not super excited to do, like, a file per thing. Jack asks their copy on write. Uh, not copy, write. but allocate on write. Yeah, allocate, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, and if the, the thing you're thinking of, Jack, is, is when you have two processes that share the same picture of, of the, the memory, like, so if you have a parent process and it forks you have a child process by default they have the same picture of the memory from that forking point and the child the os generally will just let the child reference the parents pages but if the child changes one of those pages it then will it'll do it do, it, then it will then it will do the copy part yeah okay so we got a ret here and i'm looking at the i'm looking at the manual and apparently ret takes ret takes a parameter so the, uh, However, the... the parameter, let's see. So it tells you right here. This is ah. these, honestly the ARM docs so good. It's yeah. so good. So let's good. see. Is a 64-bit name of a general purpose register holding the address to be branched to? 
encoded in the RN field and it defaults to X30 if absent. So this is where we were talking about earlier, like yeah. you can say, hey, I need you to return to this, like I need you to return to this thing and it defaults to X30. So, yeah. so what is absent in this case? Like you set it to zero? I think if you, so I think what they're saying you have is- to, You can't not be there. It's in, it's encoded in there. No, 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 it's encoded in there. I think what they mean is if you have like, let's say um, I kept some, I got some assembly around here. If you just have like a ret like this. Right, but that has, but in the encoding, if you go back to the PDF, the, the you can't not pass in a register. Oh yeah, the yeah. Re it's just saying register we... reference there all the time. So I guess if it's if you say that register that you want to do is zero, you just leave it all zeroed out. That's probably absent. Uh no, I think we need to set it to thirty. Okay. But I'm, I'm gonna do like I'm wondering how it determines absent then at the assembly level. It doesn't matter. I mean. So we're gonna do ret ret. I'm just gonna do empty like this. And, and we're going to assert zero. that it's ret. And then actually, I'm going to just print out INSN P INSNs. Let's just print it to see what the disassembler thinks about it. Um, so let's do ret. Shoot, we only have like 10 minutes. Sucks. Let's see. We'll have to continue next week. Yeah, I guess I guess we could continue in a couple weeks. I don't. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. so ret takes ret takes something. Uh, let's do the DSL part first. So we'll do def ret. Um, what did they call it? Xn. Okay. Yeah. Xn Re register or something like that. Yeah. Okay, and then we're gonna add do this ret reg. Oh, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. X. Jeremy is saying that if he, he thinks that absent means it at the level of the assembler mnemonic level. Yeah, I guess that makes yeah, sense. Yeah, yes, yes. It's not. It's not. It's not clear. I, oh, I guess we're talking assembler symbols. So in that case, it's speaking in the context of the assembler, not in the context of the actual machine. So yep, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. That's what, actually that's why I really like this. I really really like this specification because it shows you like this. The these like the curlies indicate mm -hmm. that it's like an optional thing. Yeah. So it tells you how to parse. Like it tells you how to parse. Yeah. Assembly files. It's so good. Yeah. It's so good. Um, okay. So we're gonna have an X thirty register. Which do I have? Let's do module registers uh x30 i'm gonna do equals struct dot new um to i dot new <laughs> <laughs> okay and then here we have red ret instruction ret doesn't take an immediate it takes a register right reg mm -hmm. uh do, do, reg. oh my god we're gonna do this we gotta do this so we'll do this and then um okay let's get our let's get our ob i don't know if you can you might be able to cut and paste the actual one one no, 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 long string there if you really want to no okay not do oh oh you mean from from here uh, from the pdf try. yeah, yeah. Let's do it Let's do it. Oh, come on. <laughs> it depends on how the PDF is laid out. No, you can't. Yeah. I cannot. Yeah. All right. OB 11010111. And then we have like 00, zero which I don't know what those are for. Zero, one, zero. And then five ones. One, two, three, four, five. The question was, one, two, I'm three. only a conference watcher familiar with Ruby. What was so funny about that implementation? I'm not sure which implementation you're referring to. Hmm? What was so funny about that implementation? And then, yeah, same shift it up five. All right. Uh, so we're going to do this shift up five. We but. Call... Yeah, there you go. There we yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. There we go. Okay, let's see. Does Rhett give us what we want no uh, uh it's it's in registers you you just need to yeah, reference need it to as registers, registers or you need to include it one or the other let's include it 
So I mean, hopefully we can meta program those registers, right? Yeah. Ooh, there we go. So there's our puts, like our puts output from the test. So our mnemonic is ret and our opster is empty. So there's no, like, right. it would just be ret, ret with Yeah, because we set it to 30. This is, this is what Jeremy was saying about yep. the assembler level it being absent. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So we'll just do empty and then opster. And then let's do, like, let's jump into this buffer. Just B. Okay, so we got, we got our Burke, we got our ret. We can write to it. Um, we'll say that it return. We, it takes nothing. I don't know why I did that. Uh, returns an int, which is not true. <laughs> yeah. So the question was just about that weird the the your interesting implementation of struct dot new. Yeah, because normally struct takes the the names of the data members like name or whatever whatever that you think, but those are available as methods also. So he, he, he uh, Aaron pretended that there was a data member called two I that was set to a thing so that when you called two I on it, like a method, you got the, you the, got the value. The value. Back. Yes. You I'm being a back. bad programmer. That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So if this works out correctly, we're going to JIT a function that has Burke one and then has a ret in it. So it should be Burke one followed by ret and we'll jump mm -hmm. into that. So if we run this, uh, it's going to want my password, which I will enter. Okay. All right. So we, there we did it. We got a Burke one, Burke one followed by a ret. And that is, there we go. We jumped into our, yeah. There. Yeah. So uh, uh, if I may just a couple of things yeah you could tell they're exactly 32 bits wide by the fact that those addresses are zero yeah four, look at that. eight and then c and then look also you can and then you can see as eight and c uh that's um almost certainly that's the mnemonic for undefined udf yes. <laughs> zero which means that the rest of it is just going to be zero so the yes. zero with instruction is uh, said as undefined so I, isn't this so nice though look at that zero it's four, so it's so eight. nice like I, I mean, dealing with variable width in x86 is just awful. All right, we got we got three minutes. Let's quickly do. Let's see if we can do mov. Um, yeah. So I wanted to talk. Like I really let's wanted the to get test. Just do the implementation. Yeah, let's just do it. So I really wanted to do mov because, um, like, we were talking about this has 64-bit addresses, right? It has 64-bit. 64 bit registers, but every yeah. instruction is 32 bits wide. So how do you get a 64 bit number into a, like, into a register? I think that's like yeah. very funny. Um, so we'll do mov z, let's do it down here. And the answer is, well, what do we Carefully. need for mov z? The answer uh, is in the mov. Register at immediate and a shift. Yes. But interestingly, mov z so mov z zeros out zeros out everything in the register. So when you move this immediate into a register, it zeros everything out. So that's the difference here between mov z and mov k. So mm -hmm. it keeps the stuff in there. So if you have like a sixty-four bit wide thing, you you possibly have to do a mov z followed up by multiple mov k's to get the. Yeah get the value in that, there. and that's also why uh the shift is included as an important part of this because you you have the six you have the 16 bit value but then you can specify oh i want to shift it up three so you can set 60 you can Different. set 16 bits at a time yep. of a 64 bit value yep yep so let's get mobz let's get mobz working and then quit so we can actually return let's like return a value so we're going to do mm -hmm. mobz mobz is going to take a register followed by an int an optional shift, but we're not going to implement the shift today. We'll yeah. just do we'll just do yeah. register and then immediate. Um, and we want to mov z with the register and immediate, and then uh, here register imm. Oops. And then down here when we encode it, what is our what is our bits going to look like? So, ah, this is interesting. So we actually have a bit at the top, which is our 32-bit bit, which we're not going to deal with right now. We'll just set it to zero. So zero, one, uh, one, zero. 
100101. Is that right? 100101. And then HW, which I don't know what that is. That's the shift. Oh, uh, yes, you're right. Two there, and then 16. Followed by the register, which is five. All right, cool. So we'll do, I'm just gonna hard code this to 64 bit right now. So we'll do one, like one up 32. Is that the top bit? What do you start to do there? I wanna set the top bit. Is it 31 or 31? You wanna set the top bit. 32. Yeah, 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 that's, that's fine. It's 31, okay. Uh, then we're gonna do the immediate. The immediate is gonna be shifted up um five and then our reg we're not shifting it's the bottom five bits you need some at signs there but yeah oh yeah oh, you do you. need to shift oh the, the reg is at the very end yeah. yep thank you pair programmer let's see if we can do this now can we jit a mavz mavz oh and you know what else we're gonna add we're gonna add an x zero yeah uh, so that in our test we could do mavz uh, registers x zero um, mavz five five sure. seems good All right um, let's try it run ah oh, there it is nice 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 there's our Burke, nice. our Burke our x zero and uh we're basically out of time but fun fact we can't get past this burke <laughs> <laughs> this is such a weird behavior of it so so what's going on here is the processor stops at break or the ldb stops at break right uh but the issue is that if you look at the pc px uh pc X30, right? Oh, yeah. it's it's here at 1C00, which is this Burke. So if I yeah. tell LDB, hey, like, execute the next instruction, it does. And the next instruction is break. Yeah. <laughs> so it just does it over and over. But what we can do is we can say register, register, write uh, PC. We're going to write PC to mov that one. Uh, so the question was, are these valid compiled apps? I mean, yeah, I mean, this is uh, this is a compiled program and a totally valid compiled program so all right so we did that let's do one more thing and then end the end the live stream for today uh i want to we're going to get rid of the burke but remember from our like our calling convention said that whatever value is in x0 that's what's going to get returned to the caller uh so we should see like if we run this we'll have jitted out a function that returns the value five so if we run this we should see five printed out um Hopefully, so let's do it. Not with LDB. And we do, yay! We did it! We did it! All right, let's go back to Keynote. Um, keynote with Evan, play. Okay, so we did some code. Um, if any of y'all are interested in more like ARM64 stuff, I highly recommend this book. It's a really great book. Um, you can do ARM, like I'm doing this on my M1. All this stuff applies on your M1. So if you want to try it out on your Mac, you can do it. Like some things are different and it's actually probably easier to do it with this JIT stuff than what the book says, but uh, it'll get you up and started and it's a really great book. I highly recommend it. Uh, so that is the end of my live stream today. Thank you so much, Evan, for coming. I appreciate oh, thanks for having me along for the ride. Thank you so much. And thank you all for everybody that came. Uh, have a good weekend. Bye, you everyone. Too. Bye.